the neurobiological and neuroimmune factors in autism. First, I'm going to tell you, well, I'm going to tell you about two different approaches that we're taking in our lab to study the link between the immune system and autism. First, I'm going to be talking about a non-human primate animal model that we've been conducting in the lab for the past few years, looking at the effects of maternal antibodies that are found only in mothers who have children with autism. And secondly, because I am a neuroimager, I am going to be talking a little bit about the Autism Phenome Project, which is a large-scale study that includes neuroimaging and trying to link it with immune abnormalities to find different subgroups of autism. So first, a general review of why we're interested in the immune system in autism. And we think that the immune system may play an important role in at least a subset of individuals with autism. There's now st evidence from several studies that individuals, at least a subset of them, with autism demonstrate general dysfunction in the immune system, whether it's in the form of abnormal cytokine levels, pro-inflammatory responses, or immunoglobulins. Uh, there is evidence for general, dis general immune dysfunction. And in, I think, one of the, the seminal papers, Vargas et al., showed that there are uh, neuroinflammatory responses in the brain in individuals with autism. And here is an activated microglia cell in the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. Recent evidence has also suggested that certain forms of autism are associated with autoimmune conditions. Autoimmunity, of course, being when your immune system targets your own uh, body's self-tissues. And there's now evidence that autoimmune disorders are more common in family members of individuals with autism. So things like rheumatoid arthritis are more common in family members. Uh, there's also been several studies that have shown that in the blood of children with autism, there are antibodies that are directed against central nervous system proteins. So these are antibodies that will bind to fetal brain tissue. And finally, what I'm going to be talking about today is recent evidence that raises the possibility that maternal antibodies to fetal brain tissue may play a role in a subset of children with autism. Maternal antibodies being antibodies that are present during pregnancy and are passed from the mother to the fetus and uh, presumably bind to fetal brain and cause problems. So this is Judy Vandewater. The, I come from the Mind Institute, which is an incredibly collaborative place, which is probably the only reason I can come and give this talk today, because I'm so familiar with all of the work of my colleagues. So this is Dr. Vandewater. She's an immunologist and a collaborator on our studies. And the work that I'm going to be talking about with the non-human primate model really stems from one of her papers published a few years ago showing that there are maternal antibodies that are only present in mothers who have multiple children with autism and that these antibodies react with fetal brain. In this paper that I'm citing here, uh, they, they didn't find any, any prevalence of these antibodies in mothers of typically developing children or mothers with uh, developmentally delayed children. So first, let me talk a little bit about the maternal antibody model. This is a, a diagram showing the different immunoglobulins um, in a pregnant woman. And uh, immunoglobulins target entities for destruction and removal. They're, they're typically good cells to have around. And there's a certain, there are many different classes of IG, immunoglobulins. One class, the IgG class, cross the placenta during pregnancy and can affect the fetus. Whoops. And generally, this is thought to be, or known to be, beneficial to the developing fetus. These maternal antibodies are present in the newborn until about six months of age and generally serve a protective role while the fetus is developing. Except, of course, in autoimmune conditions. And one example of this is in myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular condition that causes weakness in the muscles. And if a mother has myasthenia gravis, she has antibodies that attack the neuromuscular junction. And during pregnancy, those antibodies cross the placenta and can affect the fetus, such that in the first two or three months after the fetus is born, they actually show symptoms of myasthenia gravis as well. However, as their own immune systems develop and they begin to produce their own antibodies, these symptoms go away. So this is called neonatal myasthenia gravis. 
So the data from Dr. Vanderwater's paper show that there are mothers, um, mother, she had mother blood samples from mothers of multiple children with autism. And here is showing a Western blot showing reactivity to fetal brain tissue. There are three samples for each group, the autism group, the typically developing group, and the de developmentally delayed group. And what this is showing is that there are, ant there are proteins here, specifically 37 and 73 kilodalton proteins, that are present only in the mothers who have multiple children with autism, and you don't see them at all in the typically developing or developmentally delayed group. This is a table from that study, just highlighting this finding here. They had a sample of 61 mothers uh, in the autism group, and there was a prevalence of about 12% that had these abnormal maternal antibodies. And again, in the typically developing and the developmentally delayed group, the, there were zero. There were other banding patterns that had some, um, some antibodies in the other control groups. So we chose to focus on this 37 kilodalton, 73 kilodalton pair of proteins that seemed to be the most common in the mothers of children with autism. So the question that we asked was, are these antibodies found in these mothers of children with autism causally involved in the disorder? And one way to do that is to, to use a non-human primate antibody model. This is from a paper published a couple years ago. It was a small pilot study from Lauren Martin, who was a postdoc in the laboratory. So first, just a few words about the non-human primate animal model. First, there are several advantages to using a monkey over, say, a mouse. Uh, one is that they actually have very complex social behavior that we can uh, evaluate in, in these rhesus macaques. They have developmental milestones during infancy that we can both measure and quantify. And there are neuroanatomical similarities between the monkey and the human that just aren't present in the mouse. Here's a diagram showing the mouse brain, which is really teeny tiny, uh, and then the monkey and the human cortex as well. There are, however, some disadvantages to using non-human primate models. One is that not all of the behaviors can be modeled. Obviously, we are different from monkeys. They are very expensive and time-consuming, and there are increased ethical considerations to take into account. I do want to say a general word about the rearing strategy that we use uh, for these monkeys. So all of these monkeys live at the primate center. And obviously, if you're modeling or if you're, if you're trying to model a disorder that with social behavior is the core problem, you want to make sure that you have as normally behaving monkeys as possible. So you don't want a monkey that's grown up in a cage by itself for its entire life. We use non-human primates, um, or we attempt to recreate a semi-naturalistic rearing environment within this laboratory setting. So all of the infants are reared with their mothers. They live in these large field cages in social groups. And they're provided daily access to social playgroups with other mother-infant pairs and an adult male, trying to simulate their naturalistic environment. They're weaned at six months of age, but we continue to socialize them on a regular basis. So for the infant pilot study, we purified antibodies from mothers who had multiple children with autism and mothers who had multiple children, multiple typically developing children. These antibodies were injected into pregnant monkeys at three different time points during what would be equivalent to the first trimester. So there were three groups. One group of monkeys born who were exposed to antibodies from mothers of children with autism. Another group with, that were exposed to, through their mothers to antibodies from typically developing children and then an untreated control group. And these monkeys and their mothers went through extensive neurological and behavioral testing, specifically of the offspring, for a period of one and a half years. So as I said before, monkey research takes a really long time to conduct because you have to wait for them to grow up. So the first thing that I should mention is that the infants didn't, it's not that we, we created a monkey with autism. The infants didn't demonstrate any robust changes in social behavior. However, they did show a clear increase in whole body repetitive behaviors and increased activity in several testing par paradigms. So here I want to show you a, a video of these whole body repetitive behaviors. This 
In this video, you're going to see uh, two monkeys in a cage. This is called the familiar dyad environment. It's two monkeys. One is an untreated control, and the other is a monkey that has been treated um, with the antibodies from the mothers of kids with autism. And I bet you will be able to tell the difference between the two.